Hi everyone, um, this is Steve Davidovsky, uh, Chemistry 343 TA here at Arizona State University. And um, today, in today's screencast, we'll just go over a little bit about how to find delta T when doing a bomb calorimetry experiment. Um, so, uh, you'll recognize this is the lab handout um, provided at the beginning of the experiment. You can get this via your, our Blackboard site um, if you're a student in the class. And right here, if you scroll down to the section called Determining Delta T, you can see this equation here for delta T. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what this means in, in math language at the end of uh, this screencast. But right now, I'll go over what that means graphically, what this equation means graphically. And it's also described here in this block of text here what each of the terms in this equation means. And so if we just take a look at what um, a little you know cartoon of what bomb calorimetry data typically looks like, um, I'll tell you exactly how we're going to um, calculate delta T. So the way that we, we're going to calculate delta T um, in this experiment is we're going to fit a line to this drift rate here. Um, because our system is not perfectly adiabatic, um, it's not an ideal system, there's a slight drift rate associated with our, um, you know, our, our bomb calorimetry system having a slight um, interaction with the uh, surrounding environment. And so this thermal drift here can be fitted with a line. And we're going to do this in collider graph. This is just a graphical representation of it. And so I'll fit that with a blue line there. So you can see there's a nice blue line down there that's kind of fitted to, um, and I'll maybe shift that up a little bit there. But it's basically fitted to this um, drift at the beginning. And this is a little exaggerated compared to what you'll see in your real data set. Um, but then we can also fit a line to this final drift here at the end of the run, and it looks pretty flat for us in this um, cartoon I've drawn here, and so we'll fit that, that, and we'll make that a red color, uh, bright red color line here. And so um, uh, the delta T is going to be found by picking a point here in between these two lines and then actually finding the difference between these two lines at that point, kind of in the middle of this um, temperature change process. So that's what we're going to try to do today, is to find this um, this delta T here between these two fitted lines on um, of these drift rates here. And so uh, I'll just go over really quickly the idea of what we're going to be doing, um, and then uh, I'll show you more specifically how we're going to do that in Collidograph. So the first thing that you want to do when um, analyzing this data is you want to split your data up into three chunks or three regions of time. So in this first region here, um, this is our you know region when nothing's happening. This is before we press the button to, um, to begin the ignition combustion reaction. So this is our pre-combustion um, drift. And so uh, I'll just draw a line here kind of showing the, the, the difference here and then we can label that um, you know, region one, and so that's our region one of the of the data set here, and so then the next region is where the the actual action happens, where all the temperature change happens. So that's region two. So I'll just label that as well here, region two, and then uh, the final region is after it's kind of uh, finished drifting, and it's kind of small here, but after it's it's come up and kind of the temperature change has stopped and now the only thing accounting for the temperature change is thermal drift. And so, oh, that line didn't show up there. I'll just make that line again. So right about here was where that line was. Make sure it colors it black. And then um, we'll label this region, region 3. And so the way that we're going to do this in Collidograph is we're going to split our data actually up into three different regions. We're going to fit a line to region 1 and get the equation of it. And we're going to fit a line to region 3 and get an equation of it. And then we're going to be able to find some point to put this line, and that's going to be called TD in our equation. Um, and that's where we will find the difference between these two lines. Um, and that's how we'll find our delta T. So this right here is, is going to be our the difference between these two lines here. i just draw little arrows on there. The difference between these two is going to be where we get our delta T. All right, cool. So, 
So now let's 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 talk about how to actually do this in Cladograph. Oh well, first before we do that, um, a good question to ask at this point would be how do we find out where to put this line? Because there's these two lines have different slopes. You know, if we put this line over over here really early, that'll be a different delta t than than if you have the line over here. It'll be uh, a smaller delta t. So where do we where do we put this line? How do we find out where we put this delta t line? And so the way that we find out where we put this delta t line is that um, we'll calculate the area in between this fitted line here and our real data curve. And that'll look something like this. So we want the area between these two curves, something like this. And then we also will find the area between these two curves, between this um, the drift at the end of the run and our real data set here. So we'll find the drift or the area in between these two curves. Oh, I accidentally turned this one red. So it should be blue. And so when the area between these two curves is equal to the area between these two curves, that's kind of in the middle of this temperature event, that's where we will put this, um, this line to figure out the difference between these two temperatures. And that point in time is called T sub D in our equation here. T sub d is our equation, is, is the uh, time point at which those two areas are equal to each other. And so the way that we'll do that, oops, don't look at that one yet. So the way that we'll do that is we're going to actually, at some point later on in this, in this um, screencast, I'll, I'll show you, we're going to generate a plot of area versus time. So the area in this bottom region here, as time progresses, this area increases um, from zero and gets large. At low time periods, the area up here is really large, and then it approaches zero at long times because they, they meet each other at this point up here at the conversion from region two to region three. And so the intersection here between these two, this point here, let me just draw this here. So that point on the x-axis there is going to be our T sub D. Uh, RTD in that equation on, in the lab handout. Just do some formatting, make it a little nicer. Okay, so now how are we going to do this in Kaleidograph? So we've got our Kaleidograph open. Um, so we'll just make sure that it's, it's selected up here and then File Open. So you're going to need to navigate through your computer to find where your um, where your raw data is. And so when you go to find your raw data, um, it's saved in this dot dat format. Um, and so if if the if they're grayed out and you can't open them, uh, you just need to change this enable down here option to all documents. So they're actually a format that Collidograph can open, but um, for some reason Collidograph doesn't recognize them unless you change this here to all documents. So we'll just do an example for this benzoic acid. Um, the first run for the benzoic acid. All right, so here's a screen that you should all be um, pretty familiar with by now. Um, so the delimiter that we're going to use is space, and the number is greater than or equal to 2. And since our first line here is text, we're going to make sure that read titles is checked, and um, we don't want any lines skipped because this, um, this text document doesn't waste any time. It just starts right up. So when you click OK, you should have something that looks kind of like this. Just close out of this extra data thing here. Um, you should have something that looks kind of like this. We'll just minimize this. We don't need these anymore. We can focus on the data analysis. And so we can uh, widen this out because we're going to add some more columns to it in a minute. And so, um, and so the first thing we want to do is to just plot this data. So let's make a, if you go up to gallery, linear line, you can make a line plot. Our x-axis is going to be seconds. Let me rename these. That's not really a proper, proper name. So time in seconds and uh, temperature Celsius. And so we go to gallery line plot. X-axis is time. Y-axis is temperature. Create a plot. It should look something like this. You can format it to make it look nice for your reports. Make all these axes bigger, things like that. Make the x-axis start at zero. But um, 
So the first thing that we're going to want to do is we're going to want to um, figure out where we break our data up into the different regions. So we want to find out where region 1 turns to region 2 and where region 2 turns to region 3 as precisely as we can. And so we'll, uh, we'll use our zoom tool here. So there's a zoom tool here. This one's probably the easiest to use. Um, and you just make a box around the region that we want to zoom into. So we'll zoom in really close to this region to try to find out where this temperature starts to change. We'll try to find this ex as exactly as possible. And uh, we see that about at about 322 for me is where region 2 or region 1 turns into region 2. So I've got a little text document here, so 322 seconds. And so now we'll kind of zoom in and try to find out where region 2 turns into region 3 up here. So this region here is pretty flat. And you can see probably somewhere in this region, maybe 600 seconds is about where region 2 turns into region 3. Yep. So the most important part of this is that you just want to make sure that you have enough data here to accurately um, capture the drift, but you don't want to start um, including some of your real region 2 where the temperature is changing. So that's just something to be careful of. Okay, so now we close out of this plot. We're finished with this plot for now. We've got our two region boundaries selected here. And so now we'll just make some extra columns here just by tabbing over. Um, and uh, I'll make three columns here region 1. Region 2, Region 3. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to copy the temperature data, so our y, our y axis, into Region 1, Region 2, and Region 3 columns. So the reason that I'm doing this is that we want to separate out this data and be able to plot Region 1, Region 2, Region 3 separately from each other so that when we get to this step here, we can fit lines to these regions individually. So that's the the motivation for splitting this data up into regions. Okay, so during um, time period region 1, we want region 1 column to be the only one that's unmasked. So if we use this mask tool up here, that makes our data invisible to the computer. So we can mask it, and so that's essentially the same as deleting it. But um, in case we want to come back and unmask our data later on, um, I'll just mask the data for now so that it's not lost forever. So we'll just select these columns all the way down to 322 was what I said, I think. Yep, 322 seconds. So that's so now region 1 is the only column that's visible during the time period of region 1. So from 0 seconds to 30, 322 seconds, region 1 is the only column that's, that's visible. So now um, in between these two times, in between 322 and 600, we want column number or column region two to be the only one that's visible to the computer. So we'll take region three all the way down to about 600 seconds and we'll mask it. Now that's invisible to the computer. So now we'll take the column of region one all the way up here and mask that. And then we'll scroll down to the bottom to our region 3 time frame and we will mask region 1 and region 2 and make them invisible during that time frame. So now we can plot each of these regions independent independently. And so that's exactly what we'll do now. So we'll go up to gallery, linear, another line plot. So we'll have our x-axis be time, and then we want to plot region 1, region 2, region 3. And so when we do that, we see that, um, that we basically get the same looking plot that we got before, except region 1 is red, region 2 is blue, and region 3 is green. And in my case, they're dotted lines, but that's not really so important. We can change that to, to make them all solid lines so they're a little easier to see. Alright, cool. 
So now the next thing we want to do is we want to be able to fit lines to region 1 and region 2, or region 1 and region 3, excuse me. So now we'll go up to this curve fit tool here, curve fit, and you want to go up to curve fit options. You want to make sure that the options look something like this. You want to be sure not to force the lines to fit through 0 because they're probably going to cross the axis at around you know, 22 and 24. Um, you want to extrapolate the axis or the fit to the axis limits, and you, I guess R squared instead of R, it's not really so important. So then click OK, and then go up to curve fit linear. We just want linear fits. Um, region 1 and region 3 are where we want to fit the lines. And so when we carry out that operation, click OK. You can see there's an equation here for um, our thermal drift before our temperature event and the thermal drift after. Great, so this is, so that's good move. We're, good news, we're on our way, we're on our way. So now, because um, ultimately what we want to do is to find the area between these things, we need to generate data for um, each of the points along this line. Because Kaleidograph can't very easily find the area between a plotted curve, or a fitted curve, excuse me, and a real data set, what we're going to do is we're going to take these fitted curves and turn them into real data sets. Um, and so the way that we'll do that is um, we'll use the series function. So we just highlight this next column. And you're, you're, you're free to set up your spreadsheet in any way that you want, but um, I would recommend setting it up in the way that I'm showing you here just because then um, when, we, when we get to the formula entry bar um, component of this, uh, this screencast, you'll be able to just type in the same formula entry commands that I've I've got on the screen and you'll get the same results. So I'll just name this column here the bottom line. And I'll skip a column here and then I'll name this one the top line. <clears throat> so if you highlight this whole column, so make sure in order to use this command you need to make sure that you have this uh, little arrow here and you highlight this entire column. You go up to function create series and then um, so since we want to basically create the y component of this line, the x-axis is just the, uh, the time here. So the y component of this line, you just follow this equation here. So for the bottom line, it's 22.086. And the increment will be the slope of this line, so that will be 0 0.000. 10662. So I'm getting these numbers right here from this equation that's been fitted to this region 1. So make sure that you have the final value unchecked and the multiplier equal to 0. It doesn't matter what this is, you just keep the 0. So then when you, when you hit enter, it'll generate a data set that matches this line. So if we were to plot this column across this line, it would just be a plot of this line here. Great. So now we'll do the same thing for this top line column. Function create series. Will uh, the initial value will be the y-intercept from this one? So the number's right there, 24.616. The increment will be the slope, 0.00012106. Click OK, and now you've got um, data data sets that correspond to both of these lines here. Great. So now um, we're going to have to start to use the integrate function to, to find um, the area between these two curves. So before we do that, let's just, um, so region 1 and region 2 have kind of done their job for us. So what we want to do now is, um, and this is kind of important for later on because it will mess up your results if you don't do this step. So um, let me just close out of this plot here. So you're going to want to mask the bottom and top line columns in region 1 and region 3. So now all we care about now is region 2. We're just curious about what's going on during our temperature changing event. We've already, we've already extracted all of the information that we needed from region 1 and region 3 by generating these two data sets. So we're just going to mask these columns and not worry about region um, 1 and region 3 anymore. I'm just going to mask this all the way down just so that nothing else pops up. 
All right, cool. So now, um, so now if we plotted our data, it would look something like this. We would have this bottom line plot down here, and we would have our top line plot up here, and then our real region two data would look something something like this. And so when we use our integrate macro in Kaleidograph, it integrates from this line all the way down to zero. So way far down below our plot, um, below what we've plotted down to zero degrees Celsius, which, which isn't really helpful if we want to find just the area between these two plots. So we're going to have to actually subtract these areas. So when we integrate this line here, what we'll get is something that, that corresponds to the area um, like this here. This isn't perfect, but you kind of get the idea, I think. So the area corresponding to the area under this line. What we want is the area between these two curves. But when we when we integrate um, when we integrate oh, I should, when we integrate this line here, what we'll get is something that looks more along the lines of uh, you know of this all the way down, including the stuff down there. And that's not really too helpful for us either. But what we can do is um, we can subtract these two to get at the area between the two curves. And that's exactly what we'll do using Kaleidograph, just so that you have a little graphical representation of, of, of what the integration macros are actually doing. OK, so now we'll start to actually use the integration macro. So if you go up to macros, um, if your macros look like mine, then we'll have to do just a couple extra steps here. But if you have the integrate macro, you can kind of fast forward into the um, uh, fast forward to when I actually start doing the integrations. So if your macro li library is empty or it doesn't have the proper macros that you'll see later on in the video, you can just go to File, Import, Append Macros, and so when you do this, you'll need to navigate in your computer to find out where your Kaleidograph folder is. So for me, because I'm on a Mac, it's in the Applications folder, but if you're on a PC, it'll be in your Programs folder in the C directory. So C, Programs, Kaleidograph, something like that. And um, uh, once you find your Kaleidograph folder, it'll all look the same, whether you're on PC or Mac. So once you find your Kaleidograph folder, you can double-click on that, open it up, go into the Examples folder here, and then um, here there's a folder called Macros. So what you want to do is open up this default macros file here. So when you click open, now when you go up to this macros folder, or this macros option here in the drop down menu, you should have all of these options here. Integral curve is the one that we're going to be using today. So if you go to macros, integral curve. So what this basically is doing is what I just showed you down here. It asks for an X column and a Y column, so it's going to generate a little plot and then it's going to um, output the area as a function of time in some other column. And then it asks for an initial value. We'll just leave that as 0. So our time is in column 0. So our time here is in column 0. And right now we want to integrate the bottom line. And that's in column 5. So it shows the column down here in this little region here. So we'll go up to this macro, integral curve. 0 is the x column, y is column 5, and the output column, we'll put it out in the column that we've left um, in between the two, column 6. So, and then we can just name this column, uh, you know, integral, if I can spell it, <laughs> integral bot, and we can name this one, integral top. So now we'll just do the same thing for the for the top line. Zero is our x column, y column is column seven, the output will be column eight, the initial value is zero. And so now we've got the integral of these two lines as a function of time. Great. So now the next thing that we want, right, is to integrate our real data set, this real curve here. So a integral of uh, I'll just label it RT. Region two, so the, this this integral of this black region here that I've shown. And so, to do that, we'll go to macros integral curve. 
0 is our x column, and our y column is going to be column 3 in this case. Integral 0, y column 3, output column is going to be column number 9. So now this column is populated with the integral area underneath this black curve here. And so, um, so to find the area in between these two curves, just like I mentioned a second ago, we'll need to actually subtract these two. So I'll call it the integral diff bot. The integral difference of the bottom, the bottom portion. So now we'll bring up the formula entry bar here. If you go up to Windows, formula entry, we have our formula entry bar here. So I've already got it. I kind of cheated. I've already got it typed in here. But column 10 is the column that we're in here. Um, so in column 10, we want to subtract the integral of R2. So this is in column 9 from the integral of um, the bottom line, which is in column 6. So column 10 is equal to column 9 minus column 6. So when we do that, you can see the difference between these two areas starts out very small, and then as it goes on, um, as these two lines diverge from each other, the area between them gets larger and larger and larger. And that's what we would expect in, um, in this plot here. And so now, we need to do the same thing for the um, integral diff top. And so for integral diff top, let me just Let's go backwards a little bit, back in time here. So now we'll forget about the bottom, and we'll start working on the top here. So when we integrate our top line, what we get is something that looks like this, all the way down, you know, gives us all the way down to zero, this whole region here. Just to show you, just so we get an idea. Everything under there is integrated. And then um, when we integrate our R2, what we get is um, you know, just the area under this black curve. And what we want is the area between these two curves. So we're going to need to, but we don't just want the area between these two curves as a function of time this way, you know, with increasing time. So when we did that last one, we did the area as a function of increasing time. So it looked you know, as a function of that way. But we want the area between these curves as it processes th this way, progresses this way, to the left. And so we're going to need to do a little bit of trickery to get it to um, give us the area as it builds back this way. So it's going to start at zero at the very end of the time, and then have the maximum area at very short times. So the way that we're going to do that is um, by using this this little equation here. Um, so first we'll start off by just subtracting the two columns. So the difference between the, so the integral top column is um, is in column 8 and the integral of our region 2 is in column 9. So column 8 minus column 9. So when we do that, we, we immediately know that something is wrong because um, it starts at zero and then it starts to count up. And that's not what we would expect if we had, if we had gotten it right on the first try. And so what we're going to need to do is um, kind of fiddle with this a little bit to give us the area that ends at zero and kind of counts its way backwards. And so the way that we're going to do that is that we're going to take column nine, we're going to add to it this number here, so this number here is the difference between these two numbers, the last number in the integral top and the integral bottom. And the reason that we're adding this number here is to kind of force our, um, our formula entry to give us zero, or approximately zero at this point. But when we do that, we're going we're gonna to make these numbers um, negative. So we actually have to you know, multiply by negative one to make these things positive. A little syntax in there somewhere. One too many parentheses, perhaps. Oh, I just need a multiplication sign between these two. There it is. Sorry. And so now, when we when we do that, we see this is what we should get. We've got zero at the very long time, at the end of the time, and then we've got 
the area increasing as we go back in time. So it's something that looks like it should if it was the area between these two curves. So then, nearly finished, we make a, a line plot here, time on the x-axis, integral difference from the top and the bottom on the y-axis. When we do, we get a plot that looks something like this. And so the way that we find t sub d is by zooming in very closely on this. And there, there may be a better way in Kaleidograph to find the uh, intersection point of two data sets, but I'm unaware of it. So I usually just zoom in very close. And when you've zoomed in to a certain extent, it gives you a pretty, pretty exact number here. So for me, um, td is equal to 385.2. So that's td. So <clears throat> once you get to this point, all of the hard work of finding delta t is pretty much behind you. Um, and so now when you find delta t, you're going to use that td value. So if we go back to our handout here, td t sub d, little t sub d shows up in these two places here. And I'll just show you, um, I'll just go through exactly what each of these terms mean quickly. So tf is the final temperature, so that's the last temperature that you recorded on your, um, in your data set, so at the very end of region 3. ti is the initial temperature, so the temperature at the very beginning of region 1. Um, dt, dt, i, so this is the slope of your line that was fitted to the bottom thermal drift. So the slope of the line that was fitted to region 1. Little t sub d is the number that we just calculated. Little t sub i is um, 0, or whenever your time period began. If you had some funny business at the beginning of your run, you could mask the first couple seconds. And so if you do that, then this would be 10, 10 seconds or something like that. And then um, the same thing goes for this. This is the slope for your top line. Um, this little t sub f is the final time, so what 800 something seconds, 700 something seconds, minus um, your t sub d, so for me this is 385.2. And so when you finally do that and plug in all these numbers, you'll get a delta t value. And a good way to check to see if your delta t value makes sense <laughs> is to just plot the data, just like that first plot that we generated, and kind of, you know, use this is about 22, this is about 24.5, is it on the order of 2.5 degrees Celsius? If you have something that's like 40 degrees Celsius, you know that you've gone some, somewhere horribly wrong somewhere along your calculations. Alright, great, so that concludes um, this screencast. Um, thanks for watching.